Our scripture lesson this morning comes from Luke chapter 8, verses 26 through 39. Would you stand and receive the gospel lesson? Jesus and his disciples sailed to the Gerasenes' land, which is across the lake from Galilee. As soon as Jesus got out of the boat, a certain man met him. The man was from the city and was possessed by demons. For a long time he had lived among the tombs, naked and homeless. When he saw Jesus, he shrieked and fell down before him. Then he shouted, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the Most High God? I beg you, don't torture me. He said this because Jesus had already commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. Many times it had taken possession of him, so he would be bound with leg irons and chains and placed under guard, but he would break his restraints and the demon would force him into the wilderness. Jesus asked, What is your name? Legion, he replied, because many demons had entered him. They pleaded with him not to order them to go into the abyss. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the hillside. The demons begged Jesus to let them go into the pigs. Jesus gave them permission. And the demons left the man and entered the pigs. The herd rushed down the cliff into the lake and drowned. When those who tended the pigs saw what happened, they ran away and told the story in the city and in the countryside. People came to see what had happened. They came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had gone. He was sitting at Jesus' feet, fully dressed and completely sane. They were filled with awe. Those people who had actually seen what had happened told them how the demon-possessed man had been delivered. Then everyone gathered from the region of the Gerasenes and asked Jesus to leave their area because they were overcome with fear. So he got into the boat and returned across the lake. The man from whom the demons had gone begged to come along with Jesus as one of his disciples. Jesus sent him away, saying, Return home and tell the story of what God has done for you. So he went about the city proclaiming what Jesus had done for him. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Amen. Please be seated. So I've heard it said uh, a few different ways, but, you know, a smile doesn't cost anything, and being nice is free. Some variation of those uh, sayings, I've heard those a few times, and, and while these are fine sentiments, uh, and don't worry, I'm not going to try and dissuade you from smiling or being nice, uh, but while these are great, I have yet to find the place in Scripture that says smiling and being nice is the mark of a disciple. Maybe grand things to do, it may be good ways to be in this world, uh, it may go a long way, it may be helpful, it may be uh, the right posture for you as a person, uh, it might be the right posture for all of us, smiling and being nice, I would think so and hope so, but that's more about being just kind of a decent human being uh, than it is about being a disciple of Jesus Christ. And here's what I do find about being a disciple. Being a disciple is about following Jesus. It's about being like him and doing the things that he does. And living a life like that, living a life that is like Christ's life, being like Christ, that kind of life sometimes requires us to go beyond doing nice things. Things, being nice, smiling, and to actually doing good. To affect real and good change in our life and in the life of the world. And that kind of good, that kind of Action, that kind of following, that kind of discipleship, that kind of being like Christ, that kind of good can cost us. It's not free. I don't know if y'all know this or not, but I don't really sugarcoat things well. Um, it's not one of my gifts. It's not 
just not great at sugarcoating things. Um, but sometimes I'm not as clear as I would like to be, uh, but sugarcoating just isn't my thing. And so the truth of this, what I'm trying to say, the truth is, is that transforming the world, transforming the world as a disciple of Jesus Christ who makes more disciples of Jesus Christ costs. It costs us. It is costly to us. It cost Jesus everything. Everything. And it's supposed to cost us something, if not everything. Some churches try to hide this. This reality that transforming the world by making disciples of Jesus Christ is supposed to cost all of us something as followers of Jesus Christ. Some churches try to hide this reality. They want you to believe that it's easy. That it's easy. That all you got to do is show up. Sit down and enjoy the show. And as long as you put a little in the plate every once in a while, we're square. We won't bother you at all. But that isn't the life of faith. That isn't the life of faith to which we are called. That isn't the life of faith in Jesus Christ that compels us to be like Christ. The life of faith requires us to try to be like Christ. To try to be like Jesus in this world. As much as we fail, as much as we're going to fail, as much as we'll never be able to do it, the life of faith requires us to try. And trying to be like Christ is costly. In this passage from Luke's Gospel, Jesus travels to the region of the Gerasenes. And the whole region, the whole area is given a chance to experience Jesus. The whole region, the whole community, the whole county is given a chance to experience Jesus. And from his first step on their shores, he's confronted by the brokenness of their life together. From the first step on the Gerasenes' shores, Jesus is confronted by their brokenness as a community, as a city, as a region. This brokenness is personified in a homeless, naked man who is possessed by a legion of demons. He cannot be constrained or restrained. He is a danger to himself and others. And as soon as Jesus steps foot on the shore, this evil knows its days are numbered. And he's the first person who greets Jesus. And then we have this exchange where it's clear that Jesus, in fact, has the power to cast the demons into the abyss. Did y'all notice that? The demons say to Jesus, don't, they plead with him, they beg with him, don't cast us into the abyss. Whatever you do, don't send us back into the abyss. Don't expel us from this world altogether. Don't let us just be cast down and out of this altogether, Jesus. The demons beg. And they plead with him to go into the pigs in the field instead. And he allows it. He gives them permission to go into the pigs. And they go into the pigs and are immediately driven over the cliff into the sea, lost. On seeing this, the men hired to care for the pigs run to tell what happened. They're not excited about it. They're not running to tell the good news that the man with the demons is healed. Right? They are running to tell everybody that it was Jesus' fault that the whole herd of pigs got lost in the ocean. They're running to tell everybody because they don't want to be blamed for losing the whole herd. That was money in the bank for the owners that just got thrown into the sea. 
That was food on somebody's plate, maybe the whole community's plate, that just ran into the sea and drowned. They don't want to be blamed. And when everyone comes down to where Jesus is, when the whole city runs down to where Jesus is, at first they are astounded and overawed by the now clothed and healed man who used to live wild on the margins of the society in which they live. At first when they come down, they see this healing that has taken place, and they are excited, they are awed, they are astounded, they are overjoyed. The one in their midst has been healed. But then, then when they are reminded by those who actually saw it about the loss of profit and income that it took to accomplish this healing, when they are reminded about what actually happened, they ask just steps on their shores. They ask him to leave their region because they are afraid. They are afraid of what else it will cost them if he stays among them. Sure, Jesus could have just cast the demons into the abyss, and it wouldn't have cost anyone anything. He could have just sent them into the abyss, and it wouldn't have cost anybody in the Gerasenes region a dime. It wouldn't have cost him a penny. It wouldn't have hurt him at all. But that isn't how following Jesus works. Jesus wants partners in this ministry, not spectators. He wants us invested. He wants us to have skin in the game. He wants us to understand that this work of transforming the world is not for the weak of souls. And beyond that, he wants us to understand that our own transformation, our own salvation, will cost us something. It doesn't cost us anything to get it. That grace is free. It is a free <coughs> gift. But receiving the grace is costly. Jesus wants us to partner with him in it to make it complete. When Jesus invites us into his salvation, into his grace, when he offers us that grace and we accept that Jesus is inviting us to partner with him in it to make sure that the whole world knows about this grace, knows about this salvation, and is ready to respond and be a part of it as well. Too often we are willing and wishing that Jesus will just do it for us. All of us. Get rid of all the bad stuff and put it in the abyss. But Jesus has already done everything needed for us to experience salvation. Jesus has already done everything needed for us to experience salvation and for the world to be transformed and recreated into the promised new creation of God's kingdom fully come. Jesus has done everything needed for all of that to happen, and so he is standing on the shore of our life, of our community, waiting to see if we are ready and willing to invest with him, to join with him, to partner with him in this mission and ministry, to put some skin in it with him, to offer up our lives, our resources, our will to be in ministry with him. Jesus has made this offer to each and every one of us this day and every day. Over and over again, inviting us to experience his grace again and again and again and to offer up all that we have in service of the kingdom of God. Jesus keeps making this offer to us over and over and over again because we just stand back so afraid of what it will cost us if we let Jesus stay.
invite Jesus to stay with us. Knowing it will cost us everything. Or will we ask him to leave our shore because we're too afraid of what he might ask of us, ask of us, what he might do to us, how he will be with us. God with us.